Buying a home can be confusing, but don't worry, I'm here to make it easy. Today I'm gonna to be covering how to buy your first home for absolute beginners. This may end up being a very long video, but I guarantee if you watch it all to the end, you're gonna learn all of my secret tips and tricks from buying properties, and it will make you much better prepared for when you make that offer onto your dream home. So I made this presentation a couple of months ago and people really enjoyed it. So I figured I'd put it up on here for all you guys to see here. All right, so for how to buy your first home, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sean and I make real estate easy. And I'm a real estate investor that's purchased multiple homes over the course of my career. And we currently own over 30 units in a portfolio. So in today's presentation, we're gonna cover the benefits of home ownership, how to prepare to buy a home, as well as how the home buying process works. Now, obviously, because this isn't a live session, we're not gonna have a Q&A session here, but feel free to drop any questions you have down in the comment section below. So what are the benefits of home ownership? Well, let's take a look at owning versus renting a home. If you own a home, the good thing is your mortgage payment will remain the same if you get a fixed rate mortgage. Your mortgage is calculated so that over your 30 year period, you're gonna pay off your loan, including any interest you have on the property. But if you're renting a home, your rent can and probably does increase every single year. And depending on where you're living, that rent could potentially increase by over 10%. So even though it may be cheaper to rent today, in 30 years, your home payments will be a lot less than your rent payments. The second thing is your property taxes and the interest you pay on your mortgage may be tax deductible for you, whereas your rent is generally not tax deductible. Of course, if you do work from home and you have a home office, you can deduct a portion of your rent. But same thing if you own a home, if you do work for yourself, you can also write off a home office. Now, the big part is when you own a home, you have the potential to build equity, which greatly increases your net worth. You build up your equity by paying down your mortgage over time and by having the property just appreciate naturally over the time you own it. Now, the downside to renting is all of your rent is going to pay towards your landlord's mortgage. So you actually aren't building anything. And as I said in a previous video, if your rent is $2,500 a month, then over a year, you're paying $30,000 in post-tax income to your landlord at over a five-year period. That's $150,000 that just goes into nowhere. It's not helping you build any assets. So that's why it's important to get into a home as soon as possible. So one of the big tax breaks of owning a property is this thing called the section 121 exclusion. So this states that if you lived in a property for two out of the past five years, and it doesn't have to be consecutively, it doesn't have to be the last two years, you get $250,000 off of your capital gains taxes when you sell or 500,000 if you're married and you file jointly. So as an example here, let's say you bought this home in 2017 for $700,000 and then you sold it in 2023 for $1 million. And let's say you lived in it for two of the past five years. That means that you get $250,000 off of your capital gains. And so instead of paying taxes on $300,000, you're only paying taxes on $50,000. So this can be a tremendous amount of savings just because it's one exclusion. Now, certain states also have different tax benefits. For example, if you own properties in California, you could take advantage of something called Prop 13. And what this states is when you buy a property, your property taxes are fixed at 1% of the purchase price. So if you buy a property for a million dollars, then your property taxes are gonna be around $10,000 every single year. But the benefit of it is that the property taxes from then on are pretty much frozen and can only grow by 2% every single year. So that's why people who've owned properties in the Bay Area are still paying very low property taxes because of this proposition. Whereas if you own properties in other states like Texas, their property taxes get reassessed every year, which means that if the property values double, then that year you're gonna to to pay double the property taxes. So it makes for owning properties in California very, very powerful. Now there are other propositions like Prop 19 that allow a parent to give their property tax rate to their descendants. So I was actually able to do that and it made it so that my property taxes on my very expensive Bay Area property are similar to the property taxes I pay on a home here in Texas, even though my properties here in Texas are around one fourth of the price of properties back in the Bay Area. It's pretty insane. So the next section is preparing to buy a home. So the first you wanna do is assess your readiness. Do you have a steady income? Do you have a good credit score? And you also need to understand how debt to income ratios work. This is all for you to get a good loan on your property. Most people aren't buying their own properties in cash, just doesn't happen very often. What the debt to income ratio does is it lets the lender know if you can afford to make the monthly payments on this property with the income that you're getting from your job. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna take your total gross monthly debt, including the debt that you're gonna have to pay for the property and divide it by your gross income, which is your income before taxes. So as an example, most lenders wanna see a 43 to 50% debt to income ratio. So as an example, let's say you have $600 of student monthly debt, you have a $300 monthly car loan payment and the PITI, which stands for the principal interest, which is the mortgage, taxes and insurance are $1,100. If you add all that up, that becomes $2,000 a month that you have to pay. Now, let's say you made $60,000 a year from your job. That means your gross income is $5,000 a month. So you take $2,000, 
divided by $5,000, and then you get 40% as your debt to income ratio. Now, of course, if you have other mandatory payments, like alimony, child support, minimum credit card payments, that would all go towards the top DTI number. So they have to think about how much do you have to actually save? Well, that largely depends on what kind of loan you're getting and how much the minimum down payment is. For the most part, conventional loans go from three to 20% as a down payment. If you have a conventional loan for under 20%, you do have to pay something called PMI, which is mortgage insurance, in case you default or stop paying for the loan to the lender. This is a couple hundred dollars here every single month. And unfortunately, this payment does not help you pay down your mortgage faster. However, the good thing about this is that the PMI gets removed automatically once you hit a certain threshold and your equity hits a certain amount. Another good thing about conventional loans is that they do have lower interest than you know, other loans out there. Second type of loan is an FHA loan. Now with FHA loans, the minimum is 3.5%. They generally accept people with lower credit scores, but there are some downsides to it. Like an FHA loan usually has more paperwork, so a bit more complicated. So some sellers may not wanna sell the property to you because I know that going through an FHA loan is a bit of a hassle. Another bad thing is FHA loans have something called MIP, which is basically the same thing as PMI, except MIP does not go away. So even if the property is appreciating value, or even if you pay off your mortgage enough to have 20% equity, the MIP will still stay with the loan. So you're always paying that additional payment no matter what. So the main benefit of FHA loan is the 3.5% down payment and the ability to get these loans with a lower credit score. Now these loans do have loan limits. You can find them on the different websites, but they have maximum loan amounts depending on the location of the property as well as the unit count. So if you're buying a one unit property, it's gonna be a certain amount, a two unit property, a little higher, three and then four would be the highest. Now if you go to other loans, there are USDA loans, VA loans for veterans, and physician loans for people who are doctors. There's even loans specifically for lawyers that offer a 0% down payment, but you do need to be in a special category for that. And it probably won't apply to most people watching this video. But here are some things that you need to also consider. It's not just a down payment you have to pay. You also need to pay for clothing costs, which can be transfer taxes, towel insurance, escrow fees, lender fees, etc. A lot of the also want you to have six months of the PITI payments in reserve somewhere in cash because they don't want to give you a big loan and have you have zero money in the bank account because what if you get laid off next day? Then you won't have enough money to make these payments and you're gonna default from month one. So all these extra closing costs, I usually budget around 2% of the total purchase price. And then six months of cost reserves are just my calculation of PITI. So if you wanna know how to calculate exactly how much money you need to save to buy a house, you can check out the video where I go through it all over here, or you can just simply download the sheet by using the QR code right over here. Now, getting a loan is very important, but getting a good credit score will help you get the best that you can get. You know, if you have a very bad credit score, you're paying higher interest rates, and if you have a very, very low credit score, you may not even qualify for a loan at all. Typically, credit scores above 740 get the best terms. So don't worry too much if you're already at the 760, 780 range. But if you're in the 680 or you're at a 700 range, you can try your best to improve your credit score to 740 so you can get the best terms. Now, if your credit score is below 580, it may not be the right time for you to look at buying a house because you're gonna end up paying a very high interest rate. It might be better for you to work with a credit repair specialist or use a tool like Smart Credit to help build your credit score in the meantime. If you guys want, you can try Smart Credit for seven days for just $1 with my exclusive link in the description. So my tips to try to improve your credit score is to get this process started ASAP. Like as you're saving for money, you should also be building your score. Do your best to pay off any outstanding credit card bills. And if you need to, right before you get your credit pulled, pay them all off so your utilization ratio is basically at zero and you have the highest score possible. Of course, when you're getting a mortgage, don't try to open any new lines of credit to open new credit cards. Don't try to get a car loan because it could affect how you get a mortgage. Now, before you buy a home, you should be very clear about what type of home you want to get. The worst thing you want to do is waste everyone's time by looking at 5,000 houses only to be unsure of the exact home you want. So definitely write down things that you absolutely need that would be a deal breaker for you. So some examples of that are the location, how many bedrooms and bathrooms you need. Do you want a house with a pool already? What are the school districts like? Definitely have a conversation between you, your family, and your spouse and consider all the different factors that go into a home and decide which things are absolutely mandatory for you and which things are more flexible. The next thing you wanna do is start building your team. So who are the people that you need? Well, the number one person is gonna be your real estate agent. A real estate agent is extremely important for you when you're buying a home because they're gonna be able to review the contracts for you and they're gonna be able to give you advice on negotiating tactics on how to make the best offer for the property. Now you may be thinking, well, what if I cut them out and I try to do it myself? The thing is, most buyers aren't paying for the commission anyways. The sellers are paying the commissions for both sides. So you could potentially find an agent that's offering to give you a kickback. But to be honest, the best agents are well worth the money and just let them make the commission and have them guide you to find the best properties. The best agents are the ones that know the market very well. They know the other agents and they know how to schmooze a deal to help you get the house you want. So the best way to find great real estate agents is by referrals, 
you know, friends, neighbors, or people who've used people in the past. But if you really have a hard time, you can just go on Zillow or Google and try to find someone who knows the area very well. Now, the next person you want to team is a lender. And with this lender, you're going to want to make sure that they can actually fund the deal in your area and also have them take a look at your background to see how much you can approve. Once you do that, they can give you something called a pre-approval letter. Now, getting pre-approved is very important because it shows the sellers that you are serious about buying their homes. It'll even give you an extremely clear picture on what you can and can't afford. What some lenders are going to want to ask you for are two years of your tax returns, two years of your W-2 statements, you've added two bank statements, as well as two paychecks, just to confirm that consistency of income. They're also gonna do a hard credit pull on you to see what your credit score is. So finally, you get to the buying process. So the first thing you're gonna do is go online house hunting. Now it's kind of like online shopping. It's a lot of fun. Go on websites like Zillow or Redfin, and then start looking for properties in your area and shortlist some of the ones that you can send to your agent. I suggest setting your right filters so that you look at the properties within your right budget, within the right bedroom and bathroom count size, so you're not seeing everything out there. Personally, I like looking at deals that are on the market for over 30 days because you may find some properties that are amazingly good deals, but the thing is, a lot of agents are pricing the properties below what they're actually gonna sell for in the hopes that it generates more traffic. So just because you see a deal online that looks really cheap, in reality, it won't sell for that cheap. Whereas the properties I've been selling the market have a better chance of actually being negotiated down. Once you have a short list of properties that you actually want to see, your agent will either schedule a route for you to check out the open houses or they'll tell you when to come on property and they'll schedule something with the other listing agent to go look inside the property. Now an open house is when the listing agent will have the properties open for anyone to come by between typically one to 4 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. So you can just go, you don't need your own agent to go with you. And those are very nice because you don't have to bother another person to go check out a property. But if you want a private tour and the property is vacant, your agent can probably schedule time to go inside themselves. And they usually have a super lock box to just get the key and go inside. If you want to find out information about the open house, they usually have the information on the Zillow listing. Now a question I get is, do you need to make an offer offer before going to the open house? And the answer is obviously no. Like part of going to an open house is to see the property you really like before making an offer. So now let's talk about making an offer. From a buyer's perspective, you want to buy the property at a reasonable price, but not one where you're going to have regrets later on. But another thing too is consider the long-term effects of buying the property. You know, my parents bought our property in the Bay Area 30 plus years ago, and at the time they bought it for $200,000. Now, if they bought it for $220,000, in their hearts, they might have felt like they overpaid, they paid 10% more than market price. But think about where we are 30 years later. That same house is now worth over $1.4 million. Does it really matter if they bought the property property $20,000 or $30,000 more? Probably not. So think about the long-term effects of buying a property. And also, don't get too emotional. You know, this is kind of a business decision. If you plan on living in a property for a very long time, it hits all of your criteria, and you need to pay a little bit more, then usually it should be okay. But don't get emotional and fall into the hype of buying it for $100,000, $200,000 over the asking price, because that's where it gets a little bit tricky, and you might end up paying way, way more than the property's worth. Now, when you make an offer, there are two things to consider. One is the price, and one of the terms. If you have a very strong price, you can usually have very strict terms and you have very lenient terms, you can have a lower price. An example of that is if you're paying way more for a home, but you need a loan and a loan contingency versus paying a property for all cash, but being able to close very quickly in seven days. Some sellers want a cleaner transaction, so they'll accept a lower price. Now, another part of putting in an offer is what kind of contingencies are there. When you put in your offer and it gets accepted, you're expected to put 3% of the purchase price into an escrow account for the earnest money deposit. Now this shows the seller that you're serious and if you back away with no reason, you get to keep that 3%. You know, for a million dollar property, that's $30,000 that you're giving up. So that's why there are these contingencies here in case you need to back away. And we're gonna get into these contingencies in a later part of the video. So let's talk about closing. So once you get your offer accepted, you're gonna get wiring information from escrow and title on where to send that earnest money deposit. Now during this time, you need to be very, very careful about the numbers and I highly recommend calling the escrow company to verify the wiring instructions because wire fraud is very big out there and there's some scammers that know how to intercept email and send you an email with the wrong numbers. If you send your earnest money deposit to the wrong number, sorry, that money's gone forever. So verify the wiring instructions. During your closing time, you're also gonna to wanna to talk to your lender and give them all the paperwork that they need. Getting the loan is usually the longest part to closing on the property. So you wanna get that process started ASAP. And you're also gonna to wanna to start contacting insurance companies like Geico, Farmers, Allstate. We use a company called Steadily for all of our rental properties. And the cool thing about insurance is you're able to cancel this policy whenever you want and get a new one. So I would say don't worry too much if the policy isn't right for you, as long as it complies with your mortgage lender. So during the closing, you're gonna to wanna to do your inspections. Like I mentioned before, typically you have a 10 to 15 day inspection contingency where you can hire an inspector to come to the property, take a look around, make sure that everything works functionally. If they find anything that's significantly bad that will cause you to lose a lot more money, that's when you can renegotiate with the seller or back away and potentially get your earnest money deposit back. Another thing is the appraisal. So the appraisal is where the lender will hire a third party appraiser to go to your property, 
to determine its true value. You're gonna look at comparable properties that have sold recently around the neighborhood, compare those with the property that you're gonna buy and give it a final value. Now, this is where most people pray the appraiser is nice and appraise the value for higher than your purchase price because if the value is lower, then the lender may not give you the full amount of your property. For example, let's say you got a property on a contract for $300,000 and the lender was able to give you 80% of the purchase price. That means that you have to come in with $60,000 and the lender will come in with the other $240,000. But let's say that the appraiser determines that this property is only worth $250,000. Now, the lender will only give you 80% of the $250,000 figure, which is $200,000, and you as the buyer would have to come up with the other 20% plus the difference. So that means that you have to come up with $100,000 out of your own pocket because the lender is only giving you $200,000. So this kills many deals, and it's something that you need to be careful for when you're overbidding for a property. Now, of course, this is why you have contingencies in place. If the appraisal doesn't work out well, if the inspection doesn't work out well, and if your loan gets canceled, then you have the ability to back away and get your earnest money deposit back. So when all those reports are completed and all the docs are prepared, lender is approved, you're cleared to close, then you sign with a notary and wire the remaining funds to escrow. You may be thinking, well, I already put in 3%. Do I need to put in another 20%? And the answer is no. That 3% earnest money deposit counts towards your total 20% down payment. So you will need to pay your total down payment plus the closing costs, and then the lender will put in their funds and then you can close the deal. So after that, congratulations, you're now a homeowner. You can start building equity and creating generational wealth. Hope you guys all enjoyed this video and tutorial about how to buy your first home. I know this is a lot of information, but these are all the tips that I've learned from buying properties over my career as a real estate investor. If you guys have any more questions about buying a property, then definitely let me know down in the comments section below. And if you guys are interested in how to sell a home for maximum profit, you definitely want to check out this video over here. Thanks for watching guys. I appreciate you and I'll see you next time. Take care.